Well, good afternoon. I hope all of you are well and you guys had a wonderful lunch. We are going to begin. I am Councilwoman Michelle Martinez representing District 16, and I'm also the Vice President of the Southern California Association of Government. So welcome to our home here in Los Angeles. Uh, it's with a great honor to have you all here. Um, and for all of those folks that are on our video conference, conferencing sites, we have uh, folks from Coachella Valley, Imperial, Orange County, Palmdale, San Bernardino County, South Bay, Ventura, and West Riverside. Thank you for uh, participating via uh, conference. And with that being said, um, you know, I'm going to be very brief because we have some amazing experts here today that are going to talk to us about cap and trade. And really, um, you know, our, our theme here is California gold, bringing cap and trade dollars to Southern California. I certainly want to sit down and learn how we can bring those dollars back uh, here to um, the Southern California region. But with that being said, you know, I want to introduce you to our fearless leader and our executive executive director of the Southern California Association of Governments, and he certainly doesn't need an introduction, Hassan Erkada. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. First thing first, who didn't have lunch? There is lunch available in the other room. Please go get your lunch and come back. Uh, we're glad if, if you do. Good afternoon again. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is this is important workshop. This is one of three workshops we're going to have. There's a lot of partners that we need to thank before I start uh, that were part, big part of planning, organizing, and being with the panels today. Thomas E. of LA Thrives, David Ward of the City of Ventura, Jonathan Paffrey of Climate Resolve, Ila Rohan, Lisa Clary Real in LA Sink, Ruby Molnado from the County of Orange, Brian Nastandi, County of Riverside, Adriana Nava and Norma Villacana from the City of El Centro, and Kelly Brannan from the County of San Bernardino. I also want to recognize uh, a board member from the Strategic Growth Council, Gail Goldberg, was here. So, Gail, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to the panelist who's going to speak to you today. You know, in, in the, 18, uh, the, this, the, the title of this workshop is California Gold. In the 1800s, there were these shi the shiny little things in the foothills of Northern California. And as far as I'm concerned, this is also gold coming to the regions to implement uh, the strategic um, growth council goals of SP375. California is leading the world in environmental issues and it's nice to have money attached to these laws. I, I do want to um, uh, thank the Strategic Growth Council. They did have a lesson learned workshop here. Alice and Joe is representing them today. They do have a new executive director that I'm looking forward to meeting uh, this month. Um, we're looking forward to work with the Strategic Growth Council. Let me just remind all of you, our stakeholders, our partners, this is about the future. This is not about what happened last time or who did what. This is about how we move forward as a region to be true to our sustainable community strategy that we adopted in 2012. This agency will stand ready and able to provide resources for cities, stakeholders, nonprofits who want to put applications, strong application toward the cap and trade. I instructed my staff last month and I told our board members uh, in June that we will make resources available specifically to help our region move good projects forward. And so today we're going to talk in general about cap and trade. Uh, the next two workshops, there will be two more, uh, possibly October, November. We're going to talk specifically about the, strategic, the community strategy implementation. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I'm looking forward to working with the Growth Council, uh, with the state of California. I, I, we, we do have a long-standing uh, partnership. I'm looking forward to work with our partners here to make sure that our plan that we adopted four years ago is real. So with that, thank you, and I'll turn it back to you, Michelle. Thank you for being here. 
Let's give Hassan a round of applause. Thank you, Hassan, for your leadership. And before I begin, I introduce, um, you know, the first panel as I'm, I'm the moderator here today. I do want to take a moment and thank uh, many of the regional council members that um, are here participating. If you could please raise your hand because I see a lot of you. Just want to thank you. Um, and specifically at the sites as well. We had a joint uh, policy committee meeting and um, they've stayed here. So we've been here since 8.30 or so this morning and we're still here. You could tell that we're a committed group of folks, of policymakers that really um, have an interest in, in assuring that we're able to um, have equity um, in this process. But with that being said, I also um, like to take a, take a moment to thank all of you for, for, for being here as well and your interest in assuring that uh, Southern California um, is having this kind of conversation. And this is one of many, as Hassan mentioned. Um, I also, too, uh, just really briefly would like to thank the Strategic Growth Council. Many of us had the opportunity to go up to, uh, um, to um, Sacramento not too long ago. And again, a committed group of, 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 of SCAG uh, electeds were up there and just indicating the partnership that we've had with the Strategic Growth Council. And as we move forward, as Hassan said, it doesn't matter what's in the past, it's what we do moving forward and having all of you here as partners and making sure that um, we are, one, strategic, um, but most importantly, having this kind of information and education is going to be very crucial as we want to move forward with sustainable communities. And most importantly, how do we leverage those dollars and actually bring those dollars back home? I always say this, I come from Orange County, and I always say uh, I'm, we're so fortunate in Santa Ana because not too many other cities in Orange County apply for these dollars, and Santa Ana is always the first to always receive most of the money. And so, um, but with that being said, in my comments um, at the Orange County Council of Governments, I made it very clear that as we move forward, you know, they too, Orange County has to participate. And so I see many of them here and I want to thank them for being here and understanding the importance as we move forward in our communities and ensuring um, that money is brought back specifically uh, to Orange County. With that being said, I am going to, in the interest of time, because I'm one and, and for those of you that were here, I like to manage time. I like to be on time. And so I'm going to introduce our first panelists, but with doing that, I, you know, I've just been told that not all of you have their bios, but I think many of you know who they are, and I'm just going to read down the list so they, they could get started, because I know you certainly don't want to hear from me, because I love to talk, you know, as a policymaker, we love to hear ourselves. We may not be the smartest in the room, but we love to hear ourselves, but, but we really want to hear from, um, from, from these experts here that will be able to provide us some insight and, and some really clear takeaways on greenhouse gas reductions and how local governments can take advantage of these these funds, the three program categories, transportation, energy efficiency, and natural resources. So these um, panelists, you know, are our regional partners and they're here to help. We'll also hear about the unique approach that this fund has to ensure benefits to disadvantaged communities. Greenhouse gas reduction fund programs are meant to help reduce harmful green gas emissions to help the region implement um, our sustainable community strategy. So we are first going to start off with Cynthia Marvin, who is the Chief of Transportation and Toxic Division at the California Air Resource Board. Right after she concludes, and then we're going to start off with J.R. DiShazo. Um, and uh, Professor DiShazo is the Director of the Luskin Center of Innovation at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is also the Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Public Policy. Next, um, after, her, after his presentation, we will have Allison Joe, um, is the Deputy Director of the Strategic Growth Council, where she works as a development and implementation of statewide and regional land use planning efforts, um, including the implementation of SB 375 and sustainable infrastructure and infill and transit-oriented development policies. After she concludes, we will then have Courtney Smith, who is the Advisor and Chief Staff Commissioner of a for Jana A. Scott at the California Energy Commission, who leads the agency transportation activities, including investments in alternative vehicle technology and views. And finally, we're going to have Steve Saunders directs the Sustainable Communities Program at the Institute for Local Government. Prior to joining the Institute, Steve ran a private consulting firm, served as an executive director of a statewide nonprofit, and worked as the chief of staff to the California State Assembly member. Um, so with that being said, um, we will begin and we will start off with Cynthia. And all our panelists chose not to come up here. They're all going to speak from down here. And afterwards, we'll have some Q&A.
Thank you very much. We're following the lead of our moderator in terms of efficiency. So my name is Cynthia Marvin. It's my pleasure to be back here today. I tend to be here on this topic and on sustainable freight, which is my other passion. So wearing the money hat for today. Skag asked us to talk about two things in this first session. One was generally what's happening with the cap and trade auction proceeds, a little bit of background and context, and then specifically to focus in on some of the transportation elements. So that's what I'm going to do. Just briefly, in terms of context, of course, we have AB 32 that is directing the state's efforts to reduce the harmful effects of climate change to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. We have the governor's new executive order directing that we reduce greenhouse gas emissions 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2030. This new midterm target is really going to be critically tied to the investment of the cap and trade funds. So we'll need to be investing funds to both meet the 2020 target as well as the 2030 target. Specifically, we're here to talk about the state portion of the auction proceeds that come from the cap and trade program. And so those proceeds go into the greenhouse gas reduction fund. The legislature has provided a fair amount of direction about how those monies are to be spent. And the, the number one requirement is that those dollars be invested in projects that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that the choice of those investments maximize the co-benefits that are possible, the economic, the environmental, the social co-benefits that we can achieve with these monies. There's also a very specific direction that JR will talk about in more detail about maximizing benefits and investments in disadvantaged communities. The legislature also asked the administration, specifically the Department of Finance, to do a three-year investment plan. And the way we've been handling that, it's a qualitative assessment of the needs in different areas, identification of opportunities to essentially do good by investing more money and taking a look at the possible effectiveness of those investments. The other component of this is that the actual decisions about what programs and what agencies get how much money are made every year by the legislature and the governor in the state budget process. So I just want to clarify because a lot of people think that these funds are directly administered by the Air Resources Board, and I would like to correct that misstatement. They are done by the legislature and the governor in the state budget process. The Air Board is asked by statute to do funding guidelines for all the different agencies that administer these programs. You can see some of their logos up there. I'm just going to touch on the three main areas, the three main investment areas, sustainable communities and clean transportation. What you can see on the bottom of this slide is the amount of funds that were dedicated in the first two years of the program, and then the governor's May revised budget proposes to spend roughly $1.6 billion in 2015-2016 dollars investing in clean transportation and sustainable communities. You're going to hear more about these projects in just a few minutes. On energy efficiency and clean energy, Courtney's going to talk about those as well. Those span the gamut from weatherization for low-income households in disadvantaged communities and renewable energy. It's water energy efficiency. It's agricultural energy efficiency, public buildings. There's a growing number of programs that are in this category. Those dollars will also roughly double in the next budget. Then the third category, it's, it's a little bit of a mixture because we have natural resources, both natural and working lands like forests and rangelands, agricultural lands, as well as waste diversion. We combine waste diversion here because there's an effort underway to be considering waste as a resource and find ways not to dump it in landfills, but find ways to actually use it, turn it back to energy, turn it back into transportation fuel. And so there's a big effort to be investing in the technology that will allow us to do that. This slide shows two documents that are out for public review and comment right now. We have the draft of the ARB guidelines in terms of the advice to the administering agencies. I'm going to tell you as, as someone responsible for this document that this is a pretty wonky document. 
It's big, it's pretty detailed, it's pretty technical, but it's meant to provide general advice and structure to the decisions that all of the agencies make about how to best administer their programs to achieve the greenhouse gas reductions, to meet the disadvantaged communities requirements, and to provide accountability and transparency to all of you and the legislature, the administration, everyone else who has a stake in this. On the right, what we have is a draft concept paper for the next three-year investment plan. This is about a 20-page paper that lines out, or lays out rather, some of the ideas in each of the three main areas for new types of projects that could be funded. And we would very much encourage you particularly to pay attention to that paper. I think that SCAG and the individual entities in the SCAG region have an interest in helping guide the areas that we define for future investments because it does influence the budget in the next cycle. So this investment paper is geared to the 2016, 17, and later investment cycles. Next week, pardon, um, pardon, me. Excuse me. pardon, it's difficult for us to see. Is it possible to take your slides and make those a larger and not show some of the other information? Thank you. We are actually trying to do that. We're having some technical difficulties, so please bear with us. Thank you. <laughs> I like assertive people. <laughs> I meant that as a compliment. <laughs> Sorry, a slight detour here. Um, okay, so really the critical thing is that on August 12th, we'll be having workshops. We'll have one in the morning in Fontana and the same workshop in the evening in downtown Los Angeles to talk about both of these documents. And we would encourage you, your representatives, you know, your friends and neighbors, come on out, tell us what you think, tell us where you'd like to see these funds invested. And for those of you who can't see the slides very well, what you really need are these website links because they will hook you up to both all of the programs that are currently receiving money through the cap and trade auction proceeds program. There's a link so you can get through to all of the programs that you're interested in. There's a calendar that shows you upcoming events whether they're administration workshops or solicitations that are going out for different programs, this will hook you up with all those activities that are going on. Now what I'd like to do is switch gears from this very brief overview and talk a little bit about the transportation component of the program. The transportation elements really are designed to help entities implement SB 375 to improve transportation and mobility options across the state and to help transition to a zero emission vehicle and equipment fleet so that we can move people and goods with zero emissions powered by renewable energy. And so there are five interrelated programs here. I'm gonna talk about three of them. Allison has got the program right smack in the middle that kind of crosses and connects all these different elements. The other thing that's important to know is that the legislature in prior budgets has already determined that four of these programs will receive continuous funding appropriations. So 60% of the state proceeds from the sale of the allowances in the cap and trade program are dedicated to the, the two types of transit programs you can see on the top, transit capital, transit operations, to high speed rail, and to affordable housing and sustainable communities. And although that's a budget detail, it matters because you're gonna see, I'm on the second part, I get five more minutes. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm ahead of schedule actually. So in there, when you're, when you're looking at the budget deliberations and you're looking at the next investment plan, the discussion tends to be about the quote discretionary 40%. So the 40% of the funds that are not already committed to these other programs. So the first program I'm going to talk about is the Transit and Intercity Rail Capital Program run by the State Transportation Agency. And this does have 10% of the cap and trade proceeds committed to it on an ongoing basis. This supports infrastructure, vehicles, and equipment for transit, 
It also supports transit connectivity projects to offer an easy transfer between bus and rail, between express bus and local bus service, also to connect to active transportation. This is a competitive program. They solicited the proposals for the first two years of funding and made project selections. They've made funding awards for about $224 million worth of projects, including bus and rail projects in the Skag region. So far, it, we think that there's probably another 60, 65 million left to be committed in the current fiscal year. Because this program is based on a proportion of the revenue from cap and trade, we never know exactly how many dollars are going to be available to the programs until we've completed all four auctions that are part of this fiscal year. So there will be some more money. There will need to be another round, another solicitation for funding in this area. There's a complementary program that addresses the operations side of transit. That really is looking to provide dollars to the local transit agencies across the state based on a statutory funding formula. It also has a continuous appropriation of 5%. And it can fund quite a wide range of activities, but the bottom line on all those activities is that they need to support expanded use of transit in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The way it works, Caltrans worked with the Air Resources Board to come up with a menu of options, types of activities that could be tied to greenhouse gas reductions. So for example, if you're going to expand a transit line, let's say bus transit, and you want to put in a new route or run the bus later at night, you might use the capital program to purchase the equipment. You might use the money in this program to hire additional bus drivers to, to drive that additional service. So the agencies, the transit agencies, will need to identify which project types they'd like to implement, and those next set of proposals from the 200 plus agencies are due in November of this year. The last one is the program that's run in-house at the Air Resources Board. This focuses on the vehicles and equipment side of the equation. This is part of the discretionary 40% of the funds that are decided annually by the legislature and the governor. <coughs> Excuse me. There's about a dozen types of projects right now that are eligible for funding. The first line, the continuous line, talks about zero emission vehicle rebates and truck and bus vouchers. So those are first come, first serve. There's no competition. If you buy an eligible vehicle, you buy an eligible truck or bus, you can get those rebates and vouchers. We're also requesting proposals through middle of September for two demonstration projects, one for zero emission drayage trucks and one for freight facilities to essentially show how you can make a port, a rail yard, a distribution center, an airport, how can you transition operations at that location to be at zero or closer to zero emissions? Maybe you need equipment, you need infrastructure, you need to train your mechanics to be able to support the new types of equipment. So those are broad demonstration projects and they're, they're gonna be pretty creative, I think. That is a competitive process. The next category is the elements that we are developing over the next year, and those are car share projects, car scrap and replacement projects, uh, support for public fleets to go to zero emission vehicles, and those are all gonna be operated as pilots specifically in disadvantaged communities, generally partnering with local air districts or other local entities to implement those. The Governor's May Revised Budget proposes $350 million for this program in 2015-2016. That is the part of the budget that is still pending. So we won't know until roughly September or so, you know, what the, the funding level will be. But the Air Resources Board has already considered and approved a funding plan that spells out the types of programs and if we were to get the 350 that's proposed, how much money would be allocated to each program. So that completes your quick view of the transportation side of the programs, and thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Cynthia. And um, thank you, Michelle, for moderating the panel and uh, for SCAG uh, for convening this event. I'm uh, J.R. Duchezo. I'm the director of the UCLA Luskin Center for Innovation. And it's, um, it's my pleasure to discuss the role that disadvantaged communities will play in the spending plan and where we are in that pr process. Uh, I'll just wait for one moment until my slides come up. Well, I'll go ahead and get started uh, with the first slide since uh, I can essentially tell you <laughs> what's on it. Um, so uh, SB 535, uh, authored, authored by Senator De Leon, uh, requires that a minimum of 25 percent of the climate investments uh, benefit disadvantaged communities. Uh, so that's 25 percent benefit disadvantaged communities. There's an additional requirement that at least 10 percent of the investments are for projects that are located within disadvantaged communities. So there's a distinction being made between those that would benefit a disadvantaged community and its members and, and, and projects that are located within a disadvantaged community. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that uh, th this is viewed by everyone as a, as a floor, as a minimum. Um, and SB 535 also directed Cal EPA to define what a disadvantaged community is, which I'll discuss in just a moment. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that there is state legislation, AB 1532, that expands the, um, the, the criteria for investing to include um, not just, uh, in addition to greenhouse gas emission reductions, uh, to, to try and make these investments in a way that maximizes economic environment and public health benefits. And so those are going to be co-benefits that will be relevant to evaluating how well these decisions and investments are made. Now, the, um, the Cal Enviro screen is the result of uh, Cal EPA's uh, designation of a disadvantaged community. And it, it, it developed essentially this index that uh, takes into account at the census track level environmental health risks ratings, pollution burdens, uh, socioeconomic um, factors and conditions to identify uh, who qualifies as a disadvantaged community. And I am showing you um, Los Angeles County. Of the 58 counties, um, Los Angeles County has over 50 percent of the state's disadvantaged population. In addition, within the, the SCAG region, See, there we go. There's a little lag. San Bernardino and Riverside counties also have significant um, disadvantaged community populations. And the way these communities are going to receive these investments is still in process and, and is still being discussed. And by that I mean what constitutes a benefit to the community and what constitutes even direct investment within a community is something that each agency is grappling with. Some agencies have, um, have proposed and are using um, criteria to, to make this determination. Other uh, agencies receiving GGRF funding are still in the process. I'll say more about that in just a minute. Um, I thought Cynthia might um, present um, uh, a slightly higher resolution sort of project by project or program area by program area investment. That's what you have here in the second column. Um, it is extremely small. You'll see that there are 17 programs and even, even with 17 program areas up there, we've consolidated some of them to represent them. Um, right now, six programs have at least a quarter of their benefit targeted to disadvantaged communities. Um, so these programs would include low carbon transit operations, affordable housing and sustainable communities, low carbon transportation, low income weatherization, um, which includes energy efficiency and renewable energy, and then the urban forestry programs fall into that category. Um, and I'll, I'll just give a little shout out. The Luskin Center is, is in the process of releasing a guide to the programs funded by the GGRF that describes how they work historically what funding w w was proposed in these areas and then what new funding has become available and is proposed as available and next year under the GGRF process. 
Um, and so if you'd like sort of a guide to what, what's going to be discussed today programmatically, we're happy to provide you with that. Um, so while there are opportunities, there are also some challenges for SCAG. And, and I want to um, start at a high level and then give you a specific example before, with the remainder of my, my time. Um, the opportunity is that there is going to be $2.2 billion coming up in the next fiscal year. The challenge is that um, for all the agencies involved, uh, this is a new and ambitious process where much of the investment criteria are, are currently being discussed and worked out. Um, there are a lot of investment areas. I, I just showed you 17 different ones, and that involves some aggregation. So there's a lot of silos. Um, there's a lot of problem solving going on uh, in a distributed way. Um, another opportunity is that the Skag region has more disadvantaged communities than any other uh, in California. Um, the challenge for us as a, as a policy community uh, and, and leadership community is this funding is going to be allocated in a competitive fashion. So there's no guarantee, even though the statutes require it, there's no guarantee that funding will go into the areas that most need it. We have to make sure that happens. And then to give you an example, I want to use affordable housing and sustainable communities um, as, a, as a sort of example program of some of the challenges that we face as a region. So. Um, in, the, in the current, um, uh, the upcoming uh, year, 2015-2016, uh, there's going to be $400 million budgeted for um, the, this area out of the GGRF. So high-speed rail is the only program that's receiving more funding. Um, that's even as significant as that, as that is, there's a lot of unmet demand within the region and the state for, for these funds, given recent changes in the governance structure of affordable housing. Um, so while there's a, a sort of much needed funding, um, Southern California really hasn't done as well as the rest of the state. And I'll, I'll sort of just, I'll stop with this one example, which hopefully is going to be a call to action for us. So um, for this very important program, there were 54 projects statewide that were asked to submit four proposals this past year. Only 13 of those were located in the five-county Southern California region. And we have half the state's population, right? So 13 out of 54, but we have half the state's population. Of the 13, 11 were located in L.A. County and eight of those in the city of L.A. Most counties had no project applications move on to the next round. So most counties in the Southern California region are going to have no applications move, move forward. This is clear, clearly an area that we need to invest some time learning and, and sort of improving um, these outcomes for, for the sake of our communities. Thank you very much. Um, and if you would like uh, the guide or more information from the Luskin Center, um, I'm assuming these slides will be ma made available. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Chair, for that. that um the, the, the lead-in to the discussion around affordable housing and sustainable communities, um, the program. And while I wait for the slides to, to pull up, um, I'm Allison Joe. I'm the de Deputy Director of the Strategic Growth Council. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and, and speak to all of you, um, both elected uh, potential housing developers, stakeholders. Um, it's really important that you are here and part of this process as we talk, um, and there's there's a fairly steep learning curve for this program and for all of the greenhouse gas reduction programs. There are 17 different programs. This is not just about the AHSC. This is about how do you use all of that funding in, in concert with each other, leverage that, and, and build the communities you want to build um, and create that. And, um, and I think we're really excited to see some opportunities for doing that. Um, in the first year, um, so the affordable housing, and I'm, I'm turning a little bit to the back of the room. I feel a little bit like I'm, I'm kind of in the middle here. So I'm happy to, uh, to do that. It's a little bit of a uh, presentation style. Um, and um, the affordable housing and sustainable communities program really comprises, is comprised of two separate programs. One is the primary program that we have been talking about today um, a, a little bit, talk, focusing on uh, affordable housing and transit infrastructure, particularly around the first mile, last mile types of connectivities uh, to transit, biking, pedestrian, um, other transit options. The second component is the Sustainable Agricultural uh, Lands Conservation Program, or the SALK program. And I, um, the slide deck that I have here today doesn't cover that, so I'm spending a little bit of time thinking uh, to discuss that. 
the SALK program is really an effort to recognize that while we have a huge, huge opportunity in, in building more compact communities in fill development, we are um, also responsible for preserving uh, our lands that are in danger of being converted from ag land on our, on our urban fringes. Really important, particularly in the Southern California area. Um, the Strategic Growth Council has thought about that and um, is, 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 has developed this uh, kind of a complementary program to look at uh, the funding of ag easements. Um, how do we support those, urban, uh, those agricultural areas from being converted? These slides all focus on the, the primary AHSC program, um, and, and I may go a little bit high level here. Um, I know that Jonathan in the second panel and, and his whole panel have a lot more detailed discussion about the AHSC, so we may be, there may be some gaps. I'm going to skip over a couple of slides and skip back to um, a couple of slides, depending on how this goes. Um, so the program objectives, uh, this program funds projects through grants and loans, loans for affordable housing development, to result in the reduction of greenhouse gas traveled and increase accessibility of housing, employment centers, and key destinations, so where you are, where you're located, through low carbon transportation options, such as walking, biking, and transit. Pretty straightforward. Um, a lot of your communities are planning for this um, and are hoping to, to support it. In terms of eligible applicants, there's a pretty long list. And um, in a typical state um, or public, a public agency bureaucratic way, those applicants are um, those that you would imagine are um, primarily involved in the development of infrastructure, uh, transit transportation infrastructure, as well as affordable housing. Um, we also um, have some interesting other potential partnerships with joint powers authorities, school districts, facilities districts, universities, and community colleges. We look at developers both in terms of housing and transportation or transit development, in terms of public, private, or nonprofit. They just have to be the appropriate developer for that project. Um, and it can be a combination of developers as well as program operators, which really reflect the, the need to establish um, actual behavioral patterns, switching uh, if, if you locate um, housing near transit. The idea is to also encourage the behavior to use the transit by other things like ridership, ridership programs, um, active transportation education and outreach programs, and other things like that, also held by a public, private, or nonprofit agency. So this program is a competitive program. It's um, a statewide program, so as mentioned before, there, there are no specific requirements to, um, to spend in specific percentages of funding in specific regions. Half of the funds are required to be invested in affordable housing, which can include the infrastructure supporting that housing. 50% uh, is also required um, that we invest in disadvantaged communities, which were, um, you know, there's an incredible need in Southern California. Um, these two 50% requirements are not mutually exclusive. You can have an affordable housing development in a disadvantaged community, clearly. Um, and last year, in our first year of this program, we awarded $122 million, um, which was a, a, a really big accomplishment next year. Um, however, we have $400 million available, and we're excited for that opportunity to really, um, we've, 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 we've basically gone through in our first year proof of concept. We've shown that there's a need. We've shown that, there, that affordable housing is vital to the development of our sustainable communities and that it's, it's important to encourage um, low-carbon transit options um, and transportation options. In this, in this case, we have about $400 million next year. This is where I skip. So I wanted to go through timeline um, because that's something that you guys are all interested in. Um, one of the, the concerns about last year was the, the complexity of the guidelines, learning a new program um, and being ready and competitive. And what I want to do is make sure that we start, we, uh, start as soon as we can um, to really identify where there are opportunities in the region to develop these applications, to make sure we have the right partnerships available, um, and that we as the state, the SGC, actually have the guidelines that reflect the priorities of the community, of the region, and, um, and are fundable. So we're doing what we normally do uh, with any kind of uh, 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 new program. We're revising our guidelines to better meet the needs of what's going on on the ground. Um, and we saw a lot of things that we could improve on, and I think this fall we are planning to re release a revision to those guidelines. 
we um, are doing pretty extensive outreach on those guidelines specifically. Um, at the same time, we're also looking at technical assistance opportunities to support um, potential applications. We know that every, um, every jurisdiction has a potential application. The question is, how ready are you to apply this year, next year, future years? And how can we make sure that at least you're getting, you're getting the updates, you're, you're, where, you're, you're communicating with the program staff and with other potential partners to be ready and be more competitive? Um, you know, the, I think some of the conversation will, will, today will be about how can um, the SCAG region be more competitive. Uh, I think we, we saw a lot of really good applications. We want to see um, applications, good applications and fund them. So this is the start of basically identifying where we can get the, the ones that are greatest in um, the, great, that meet the, the objectives of, of the program and that meet the, the, the priorities of the region as well. So in winter, we're going to essentially adopt the Strategic Growth Council. Um, my, my bosses are going to essentially re uh, adopt, hopefully, the guidelines, and we would have a release of application by, um, by early uh, next year, 2016. Um, with that, we hope that the applications, at least in a pretty close to final form, would be available prior to, um, at the same time as the guidelines, you can see what we're requiring in the guidelines, what the application looks like, what kind of components would be required, um, and 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 hopefully at that point we will have um, um, an idea of technical assistance opportunities to assist those who are applying for the funding um, to uh, throughout that process, as well as um, questions and um, certainties related to the quantification methodologies of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So those three things together provide a better advantage for everyone in the state to be able to have a ready application um, in the spring of 2016. Um, with that, I'm going back to my closing slide. Um, and just if there are any questions, we have um, a standard email address, but um, we have a very small staff, so you will get that, that email answered fairly quickly. Um, our website also has additional information, and we'll be back in um, Southern California to talk more about the program. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Allison. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Smith. Uh, I am with the California Energy Commission. And today what I'm going to do is provide a high-level overview of the suite of programs that are financed through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund that are focused on clean energy and energy efficiency. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, there is 40% of the uh, the monies that remain unallocated, and all of the programs <clears throat> that focus on energy fall within that 40%. Um, so even though she mentioned that, um, according to the governor's May revised budget, we're anticipating the suite of programs to receive double what we've seen, um, really until um, the legislature and the governor finalize this uh, part of the state budget, um, we don't know how much money will be coming from fiscal year 15-16. That being said, up to date, uh, these programs have received approximately $160 million from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. <clears throat> and these programs all focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, like I said, through clean energy and energy efficiency uh, strategies. In addition, uh, back in March, the governor's emergency drought executive order established a new program, the Water Energy Technology Program, which is to be housed at the California Energy Commission. Um, and this is proposed to receive $30 million, but we are waiting until September. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the programs pretty quickly. <clears throat> the Low Income Weatherization Program is administered by the California Department of Community Services and Development. Uh, and this program really focuses on supporting uh, rooftop solar, uh, installing hot, uh, solar hot water heaters, and then also doing weatherization retrofits on homes that belong to low-income households located within designated disadvantaged communities. Uh, currently, uh, the, the Department of Community Services and Development, they've uh, selected a, a 21 service providers located throughout the state of California. And it's through those service providers that qualified households can apply to actually have their homes uh, retrofit. The website that's provided on this slide is how um, interested applicants can uh, connect with their service provider. 
The California Department of Food and Agriculture actually has two programs funded through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Their Dairy Digester uh, Research and Development Program uh, provides competitive grants to support the installation of dairy digesters, which produce renewable energy. Uh, in addition, the, their state water energy efficiency program provides competitive grants as well to agricultural operators who are interested in uh, putting on-farm projects that are pursuing on-farm on projects that save not only water but, but energy as well. Um, so both of these programs have already spent all of the money that they received in the uh, 2014 state budget originally. Uh, back in March, the Assembly Bill 91, Emergency Drought Bill, actually allocated uh, 10 more million dollars to the SWEET program. The application for the, this, uh, this $10 million has closed, uh, and they anticipate announcing the awards in September. The Water Energy Grant Program is administered by the Department of Water Resources. This program provides competitive grants for water and energy efficiency projects at residential, commercial, and uh, in, inst uh, in, in the institutional space as well. Um, they have already awarded their 2013-14 money and are in the process of uh, continuing to award the $20 million that they also received from the AB 91 emergency drought bill. This may be of particular interest to you as uh, local agencies are part of the eligible applicant list. And then lastly, uh, the Water Energy Technology Program uh, is being administered by the California Energy Commission. Um, and as I mentioned previously, this is a, a relatively new program, so we're still in the process of de, uh, doing the, pro uh, the program design. Um, this program also focuses on water efficiency, but what distinguishes it from the other water and energy focused programs is that it's really focused on innovative technologies. So these are technologies that while they're commercially available are not widely adopted. And so the idea is to really accelerate the adoption of uh, innovative technologies in the residential, commercial, agricultural, and uh, industrial space. Uh, the program is broken up into three phases. Uh, the first phase, which is uh, deals with agriculture, uh, just we just finished our guidebook for that. And then for the second phases, with, which deal with um, the industrial, commercial, residential, and then also a third phase, which is um, aims to increase uh, the energy efficiency of existing desalination plants and also exploring potential for renewable power on desal plants. Those will be discussed at a public workshop later this month on August 26th in Pomona, California. So if you're interested in participating, you can get more information on this program at the website below. And with that, I will pass it off to Steve. Thanks. Um, and I'll wait as well. Oh, mine, there it is. They're, they're quick now. Um, I'm Steve Sanders. I'm with the Institute for Local Government. Um, and the, thanks. Yeah. We are the research and education arm of the League of California Cities, California State Association of Counties, and the California Special Districts Association. So we work directly with cities, counties, and special districts. We're housed in Sacramento in the League of Cities building and work very, very closely with those statewide associations and their staff, um, which um, uh, and what we do with um, the League, CSAC, and special districts is provide help on sort of longer-term issues or more in-depth issues that city and county and special district officials have to grapple with that may not be in the hubbub of the daily work of those associations, which is making sure that the legislature um, appropriately acts and the governor appropriately acts um, at the policy level on an annual basis. We have a sustainable communities program, which provides a number of different resources. So if you are an official for a city or a county, or you're a staff person for a city or a county, we're, we're a resource for you. Actually, if you live in a city or a county, um, you're, you can rely on us as well. We would like to help residents and stakeholders as well as officials um, in dealing with problems that they have. 
We also have a statewide program um, that it, it currently includes 75 cities and counties that are voluntarily taking action consistent with the state's goals on AB 32 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And they're very interested, as are other cities and counties, in capitalizing on the cap and trade program to implement and pay for the programs that they've been testing at the local level. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today um, about a subset of those programs. We have an infographic that we've developed which summarizes um, the 13 state agencies and the various programs that they that they administer. Um, but uh, what I'd like to talk about specifically are the natural resource programs. Allison's already talked a bit about the sustainable agriculture and land conservation one. There's also urban and community forestry programs, wetlands restoration, and waste diversion um, would round out um, the, the suite of programs that the state is currently running with cap and trade funding. On uh, urban and community forestry, um, th these are programs that support uh, multi-benefit projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And it's uh, actually a compilation of a number of different programs that CAL FIRE, um, the state department that deals with this, has been running for a number of years. It's, it's a, an example of how the state has tried to sort of bootstrap and speed up the cap and trade program by looking at existing state programs and adapting them to the cap and trade um, um, funding regime so that those existing programs can be beefed up and built upon. Um, uh, you can see here that um, there's a number of different kinds of projects that are funded. Um, what you may be interested in are the seven projects that actually got funded within this, the SCAG region. Um, there were 28 projects funded statewide. Um, seven were within the SCAG region. Um, in LA County, San Bernardino County, um, primarily. And so you can see that um, in, some, in some areas, um, the SCAG didn't necessarily receive the bulk of the funding or even a proportionate share of the funding, but some interesting and um, exciting projects were funded. Um, One and a half million dollars uh, for Green Innovations Grant to the LA Conservation Corps, for example, that would be doing tree planting and water conservation uh, in San Pedro, and particularly with a focus on disadvantaged communities. And so that's an example of the kind of program that was found to be competitive and that was funded at a fairly high level. Um, wetlands restoration, also another um, program area. Um, these are projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions by restoring or enhancing wetlands or mountain meadow habitats. Um, there's a geographic um, limitation to where they can be funded. And of the 12 projects funded statewide, only one was in the Skag region. Um, that was a project in Seal Beach in Orange County. And so um, that um, that's an example of um, maybe looking at an area where you didn't know that you might be able to compete and being able to do so. These projects, these programs will all be evolving over time. Thirdly, on waste diversion. Um, these are projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions through expanding waste management infrastructure. And, and really, they're, they're doing that in, in a couple of ways. One is looking at um, producing um, energy or fuels from waste and, uh, or compost. And, and the second is by using um, recycled materials and therefore diverting them from the waste stream. Um, Los Angeles and the Skag region was much more successful here than it was typically in other kinds of program areas. Of the eight projects that were funded, four of them were in the Skag region, um, uh, Riverside, San Bernardino, and LA County all received funding. And examples of those kinds of projects, um, organic material program in Riverside County, expansion of an anaerobic digester, um, recycled fiber, plastic, and glass in LA County, um, that's to help with the use of recycled material um, for manufacturing. So these are all programs that are relatively new, are going to evolve over time. The state's very involved in developing and revamping guidelines for all of these, but it's important to keep a longer view of this. If you're not funded this year or next year, 
get prepared to be funded over the longer term because this is a significant source of funding for sustainability investments over the long haul. And so my, my last um, um, plea to you would be get in touch with us. We hope to reach out to all the registrants with some easily digestible material that you will help you learn more. And we are available in Sacramento to either answer questions or direct your questions to the right folks. We're very interested in having the 540 cities and counties in California benefit directly from this major investment that the state's making through cap and trade. It's okay, I'm gonna leave that for you guys while I do the Q&A. So. Let's give them a round of applause. Great information. So to start off the conversation, I already see the hands raising up. Uh, um, so definitely I, I was presented with some themes and some questions, but I'm certain many of you have your own questions. So I'll go ahead and begin with folks in the audience. And I see one person here, and then I'll move forward to the folks at the video conferencing. I see another. So let's start off with you. Yep. Uh -huh, thank you. Um, First, uh, Barbara Kogerman in uh, Region 13, um, Orange County. And a uh, couple of things. One, can we get PowerPoint s slides for these presentations? There's so much information, and we're, you know, we're not all secretaries. Um, it's just, you know, we, we need to have copies of these slides. It would be so helpful. Secondly, um, when you define a, um, a disadvantaged community, does that have to be an entire city or can that be a large area or a defined area within a city? Uh, that's defined at the level of the census track. So you can think about it as a okay. medium-sized neighborhood. All right, great, thank you. Uh, third, um, I, you're looking at uh, under the urban and community forestry, um, you can only water trees now if you're using recycled water, and unless you've gone ahead and redone your irrigation system to separate the potable water from the uh, recycled water, you're not going to be able to, to uh, irrigate those trees. Can you get funding to repipe your irrigation systems in your, your cities, communities, parks, et cetera? Would that be a viable uh, grant application? That's a really good question, one to which I have to admit I don't know the answer. Right, um, but um, I don't know if anybody here from the state program Some of the water energy efficiency programs do fund basically more efficient watering if there's also an energy savings. So you can't get funding under that under the urban forestry grant, but you could seek a, one of the other pots of funding for that component. And the urban forestry has a requirement that they be trees that obviously are drought tolerant. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you. Um, we have a question here, and then the gentleman, and then here. And any questions out here, just please just raise your hand as well. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Nancy Pfeffer. I'm a staff to the Gateway Cities Council of Governments in Southeast LA County. Um, one of the budget proposals that came out towards the end of the budget cycle, I think it might have been the assembly one, but I'm not sure, had $8 million program proposed for technical assistance to disadvantaged communities. And I'm wondering, um, I'm starting to hear that maybe that's not going to happen, and I'm wondering if any of the state folks that are here could uh, tell us what's the status of that, and uh, I just would love to see more support for that. I think we really need it to ensure that we get a lot of applications in the process uh, from the disadvantaged communities. Thanks. Uh, this is Cynthia. I'd be happy to do that. So we, of course, can't project what the legislature and the governor will do on a specific proposal. What I can tell you is that the budget that was passed in June includes some resources for technical assistance for disadvantaged communities. The Air Resources Board got a person who will be dedicated to that, and we got contract funding. What we're planning on doing with that contract funding is hiring either someone through the UC, CSU, community college, or a nonprofit type organization, or several of them, to be our eyes and ears in a community, to be a resource for the disadvantaged communities around the state, and to be the place that a community can go and say, here's the changes that we want to make in our community. Community. Here's the kinds of projects we want to do. What of these projects fits within this greenhouse gas reduction fund program? 
those people will hook the community up with the different programs and we are there's a legislative proposal right now in the budget to provide a contact person a disadvantaged community liaison essentially at a number of the key agencies that have a large investment in that area so it i think it will go a long way to making people aware of what's available and instead of saying you figure out within this uh, rather dizzying maze of state agencies, you know, where to go, tell us what you want to do and we'll tell you what fits. Fantastic. Would that would be wonderful. I'm David Pollack, uh, council member for the city of Moore Park, and I, I'm almost hesitant to ask this question because I know there could be some political sensitivity to it, but I think it needs to be asked. We, you, you've referenced a number of times our poor showing in, in the approved applications mm -hmm. for the last round. Um, but I don't know, was that was that our fault for not um, applying in as great numbers as Northern California, or was there some bias in, in the matrix? What, what, what went wrong? <laughs> Thanks. This is Allison with the SGC. I don't think that it was anyone's fault, per se. Um, I think that this was a, the first year of a lot of money in many programs coming down the pipe with a lot of different moving parts. Um, some of the programs, so the SGC program, the two components were the, it's the first, uh, the only new program out of the suite of 12 that were originally offered. Um, and there was a huge, as I mentioned, a huge learning curve for staff to put together a program that met the objectives of the law that was passed, as well as for those on the ground who didn't know what the program was going to look like pretty much until the guidelines were released with a very short timeline to then seek out applications that met the objectives and then get them through the application process and awarded in one one year so it was so that so I will just speak to that yeah, I think that's a huge bias, challenge though, that doesn't explain the bias um, so again no one's um, so then the I believe what happened was the readiness of those applications given the complexity of the applications it was harder to pull together competitive applications overall and there were some regions that were better prepared to look at how um, that, uh, some of the components than others. And I think we um, owe it to ourselves to think about how we can better do that in future years and, um, and really think about um, less of a bias but more of a can we make sure that the guidelines that we develop reflect a statewide perspective that, that allows for all regions to participate and, and compete as well as making sure that um, as we do this the, the look at look at readiness of these projects that we don't sell ourselves short and really get the fund the projects funded that that are um, that are the most competitive as well. So Hassan. let me let me just add a couple of things to what Alison uh, just said. First of all, let me welcome another board member of the Strategic Growth Council, Professor Manuel Pastor. Um, the both Manuel and, and Gail heard a lot from us and they're probably sick of hearing about what happened last time. Just, I agree with Alison, it's, things were happening so fast that uh, we even as an MPO didn't play the role that we should play. One of the reasons for these workshops we're having right now is to make sure that we as a region are ready uh, uh, to compete for the next round. Uh, the first round went really fast. Uh, we have issues with the guidelines, but there were no times. The role we, we played as an MPO for the region was not necessarily clear. But I agree with that, it's nobody's fault. What I want to focus us now is how we move forward to be competitive. We're, we're okay with, uh, we're very much welcome the competitive nature of this program. We adopted the regional transportation plan that's used as an example for the rest of the country. So we do have a lot of projects, and it's up to you here in this room, up to our cities and counties and stakeholders. Uh, we're challenging you to ask for help if you want to put application to make sure it's competitive. I'm challenging you, I'm telling you, this agency is putting resources to help you compete statewide. And I'm almost certain we're gonna do better in the next time around. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, Hassan. In the interest of time, I know we have po uh, people that want to ask questions. I am very assertive. Uh, please, <laughs> for those that don't know me. <laughs> Megan Sally Wells, uh, City Council of Culver City. 
Um, along the same line of questioning, which I know is going to be a recurrent theme, it was a it was a theme in the panel as well. Is there the possibility of allocating these resources 50-50 north and south? Number one, and number two is um, and then leaving the competition with each within each sector, so not losing competitivity, uh, but getting some balance. Um, and then number two, uh, as we move forward and as grants are rejected, do they come with comments? Uh, the, the gentleman said, you know, keep applying, but you want to make sure you're applying in the right way for the right thing with the right words. Um, so thank you. Um, so to the, your first question, yes, that's a possibility. Um, that can be determined um, a couple of different ways. We've seen some of this play out in conversations with the legislature um, in both the budget sessions as well as through the standard legislative process. Um, that's not something I can uh, easily determine. Um, but staff are ready to, to implement however that direction may be received. Um, this can also be addressed administratively through, through um, our own guidelines documents. So there's a couple of different ways that can come about. What we've done in these listening sessions throughout the state is, is, is heard those comments and really looked at um, how you could do an allocation and if that's appropriate given the, the nature of the program. Um, there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. Right? Um, and so the other question that you had is on feedback on those who had, who had submitted applications. Uh, we received 147 applications at Concept. Some were, um, again, more ready than others, more complete than others. Um, every one of them we've, um, and we still do, um, staff are available to provide feedback on the applications submitted, um, including how to make your application stronger, where um, you may have had some challenges, and then um, as well as a full application. Um, and, but if you hadn't even submitted an application. Um, at this point, we're in pre-application technical assistance and are, are always ready and able to, to, to assist with the phone call. If we're in the area, we'll, we'll, we'll do some, some in-person meetings as well. One quick response, which is that we're working closely with the League and CSAC right now to uh, reach out to the various cities and counties that applied, because many of the applications were done by, not by cities and counties directly. Um, but and find out what their experience was, what lessons they have, and we work closely with STC and others to provide that kind of feedback as well. So uh, you'll probably be hearing from me. Great. We have a question here. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Wally Sumbav. I, I direct transportation uh, research in uh, at the South Bay City Council of Governments. And, and Allison, if this sounds familiar, it's because you and I have spoken at length about this before. But I'm wor I'm wondering about the criteria going forward. Um, in that the disparity between North and South that we've already talked about, but the disparity within the South, which is the city of Los Angeles, got so many grants, has undoubtedly to do with the richness of their transit infrastructure. And since, generally speaking, most of the resources in transit are, in fact, concentrated in the city of Los Angeles, is there any thought to developing other criteria for locating affordable housing other than adjacent to transit? It would make no sense in the South Bay, for example, to we don't have very good transit. We're not going to get very good transit. And, but we're working on more of an access model where we're looking at proximity uh, rather than transit as the intermediate. We can simply make people close to where they're going. So we would surely like to get a shot at affordable housing development under that model as opposed to a transit model. Sure. Um, so uh, the, the short answer is yes. We've, we, um, we're, we are thinking about how that, that, that interplay of, of transit and proximity to transit play out. Um, I know that we've talked about it, and I'd love to take that, that, that conversation offline. Um, we did um, request for um, request comments on our second iteration of our guidelines. I didn't see yours in there, but I'll, I will pull the, pull the past conversations forward and look at that. I can't do anything about that. I'm sorry. Great. We have a couple more questions over here, and then I'm going to go to the satellite offices. But um, I, uh, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Antonia from Huntington Beach. Uh, is it a requirement to have a climate action plan or a greenhouse gas emissions inventory to apply for funding? Uh, we have a conservative council, and it's something that's hard to uh, push through. But we are still interested in applying for some of these grants. Uh, so no, there isn't, there isn't that requirement. Um, there does have to be some degree of planning that kind of meets those general sustainable goals, but I know that different jurisdictions handle them differently. So there's some flexibility there, Thank for you. at least for our program, and I don't think, and for all of the other programs as well. Great. 
another question back there. Can you please give the microphone back there? Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Joyce Dillard, I'm, I'm a citizen. I want to address this on a, the level of what the public expects out of this or even knows. We haven't seen any of these things incorporated in our community plans. The Hollywood plan went down in court. There's going to be a lot of lawsuits involved with like uh, the mobility element and things like that. It's a, a huge deal. And I can't see from the guidelines, and I've been at these events, where this is incorporated to re really actually show results and how you're going to do that and um, how you're going to justify your DAC communities when gentrification has literally moved those low-income communities out and how you're going to also justify it to the Canadians. I was at UCLA at an event with the Canadians. They didn't know anything about this at all at that time. I don't know if they do. And they're part partners in this cap and trade. So how are you addressing all these other aspects other than just the governments here? So um, I think we are looking at the, the, the goal is that we are implementing the, the local planning efforts. So to the extent that, that a, a, it would be reflected in a, a general plan, a, a, a community plan, or a specific plan, that's something that is along the lines um, and, and would ideally be wrapped up in the, in the regional um, SCS. That's something that we're looking at. Um, and so at the local level, that's something that we would look at towards readiness, right? To be ready, it should be incorporated in the local plans. Um, the discussions around um, displacement and disadvantaged communities and, and gentrification is something that we are concerned about and we've addressed in some ways. I think there are some ways we can we can be clearer about and think more thoroughly and um, certainly a concern for our program. With respect to the question about Canada, I'm presuming that's a reference to our partner in Quebec who participates in the cap and trade program with us. What you should know is that although companies can buy allowances for both programs, offsets from both programs are within the, the universe, the monies, the proceeds that come out are separate for each different partner in that process. So the proceeds that go to the state of California are independent. Uh, Quebec has nothing to do with how the state legislature directs that those funds be used, nor do we have any influence on how they might choose to use their proceeds. Just a, a quick, um, I, you referenced sort of follow-up and evaluation. I think as a community, we owe it to ourselves to every six months to, to 12 months, reevaluate how well we're doing, how funds are being spent, because it's going to be a monumental challenge to track spending and to track our own competitiveness. Great. Um, we're going to go to the satellite area uh, conference. We have four minutes, so I'm going to start with Orange County. Do we have any questions in Orange County? Looks like we have no questions in Orange County. Okay, can we, uh, Riverside, any questions in Riverside? We have one question. This way. You know, it appears that the uh, disadvantaged communities map is the same map as the new market tax credit for the federal government. As this is a grant program, ha has there been any uh, uh, conversation with the federal government regarding a lot, helping cities uh, help finance these programs through new market tax credits? Uh, I can only speak to the presumption of your question, which is they're, they're not precisely the same maps, but there, there probably is considerable overlap. And in terms of coordination, uh, I don't know. Is there anyone on the panel that wants to speak to that? No. Sorry. Sorry. To the extent that um, a project could could be also could also qualify for new market tax credits, we'd look at that as um, as 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 a component of the application for the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program. Well, if I take your map and I look at the new market tax credit map based on the census tract, and I look at your map, it's exactly the same for most of the re region in Riverside and San Bernardino County. So, uh, and so in, in doing the assessment. It, even so, when I submit my application, I'm hoping that I would get more points because it might be more be able to be fully funded by using new market tax credits and your grant program. So I think it's one of the advantages that we have. A lot of our places have the same sort of uh, designated area based on the, based on the census tract. Great. Thank you. The city of, uh, excuse me, San Bernardino County. Anyone in San Bernardino County have a question? Going once, going twice. Looks we have like no questions in San Bernardino. How about Ventura County? Yes, we do. Hi. Um, 
I'm, I'm Chris Williamson, City of Oxnard. We have five highly qualified census tracts in the 5%, 95%, whatever you right. call it. And I was wondering if the legislation or any other uh, uh, policy you've developed, whether you've considered or could still consider something like a CDBG set aside for communities where you know you want to put money and some portion of this larger amount basically is a formula grant for qualified projects. And so it's not, everything isn't competitive. It's just hard to justify writing all these applications when you're not sure you're going to get the grant. Any responses from our panelists? Um, I think that's a, that's a, that's a good suggestion. The, as again, some of this is, is tied up in the legislature, um, and some of it is something that could be done administratively. So. Um, we hear your comments and we are looking at options. Thanks. Any more questions from Ventura? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're off to um, the CBC COG. Any questions? Looks like we have no questions. No. Im Imperial County Office. No, Madam Chair. Thank you. CVAC. No questions. Fantastic. Palmdale, I, I don't see anyone there. Okay, um, so let me bring this back, and, and, and my apologies in the interest of time, I'm trying to get as many uh, questions, you know, to the panelists, and we're just on time, and so... Pardon um, me, I Orange, County. Orange, Orange County? Orange County has a question? Yes, thank Orange you Orange County, so much. Okay, one question, we have 30 seconds. You bet. Could you be very specific on how you could end the disparity between North and South? Not a general statement, but be very specific on how that can be remedied. Thank you so much. I think we don't have enough time to be that specific. Is that That's correct? an offline conversation. Yeah, uh, we're happy to think more about it. Uh, you know, it's a long-standing standing issue. Um, some programs out, uh, uh, apply it differently depending on what we fund. We're funding a lot of different things. There are a lot of needs from both the housing and transportation um, sectors. Thank you. Um, oh, I, I just wanted to you? note that that focus has been on affordable housing and sustainable communities. As all of the other programs roll out, you can't make that same conclusion that it's biased in favor of the North and not the South. There are going to be other programs that are the opposite. So I think if you really want to get a sense of how all these dollars are being invested, you're going to need to look at and consider the whole spectrum of investments. There's a number of different mapping exercises that are underway by both NGOs and the state to show you where all the investments are going very specifically. So I think in the next few months, we're going to get a much better sense of the overall balance. Fantastic. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. And we are now moving on to the uh, next panel. And before that, I'm going to introduce Hassanar Krata. You know, I'm, I'm done for the day, so you guys will probably say thank goodness. But uh, with that being said, thank you for your patience. Have yourself a great day. Thank you, Michelle. On the north and south split, we would be okay with 100%, 0%, 100% coming to Perfect. the south. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce the next moderator for the next great panel for you. Uh, Jonathan Pavri, uh, the executive director of Climate Resolve, need no introduction really, uh, but I'm going to say a little bit about him. Uh, Jonathan partnered with Move LA, and LA is sync to launch the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund Alliance, uh, Climate Resolve developed and maintained Sea Change LA a hub for all things climate in LA. It featured the latest local science while highlighting local solution to ensure that Los Angeles not only survives in the face of climate change, but thrives. Jonathan is the executive director of Climate Resolve. He was a commissioner of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power from 2008 to 2013. He's a founder of Cislavia and the Los Angeles Regional Collaborative for Climate Action and Sustainability. I could go on for on. Most importantly, I consider him a friend, a leader, a partner. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Powell. So thank you, Hassan, and, and thank you, Washa. 
Um, it's wonderful to see resolving regional challenges up on that wall, and we can change that to climate resolving regional challenges, I think, uh, as well. So. And I uh, want to welcome the uh, people participating at the regional video conference sites, and uh, we will definitely include you in the Q&A uh, portion of this. So as you heard earlier, there are about 17 uh, programs that are currently operating to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, through the, the state of California. And we're now going to focus in on just one, the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program. And this is very much aligned with the work that has been done in fulfilling SB 375, the Sustainable Community Strategy. It's part of the Regional Transportation Plan that that SCAG and other MPOs have been involved in. And to, to do a thumbnail sketch, this program is to do a smart growth planning to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And, and in doing that, uh, to help fund uh, transit-oriented development and to improve connectivity uh, via, via uh, new transit or new transit operations. And, and that's what these dollars are, are going for. So what we're going to talk about is, as this fund goes from $122 million in 2014-15 to over uh, $400 million in the next fiscal year, um, we're going to look at how the SCAG region can perform better. So this last year, uh, SCAG received about 27% of the affordable housing sustainable community dollars, about 32 million of the total 122 million. And had it been at SCAG's current sort of population standard, if we applied that, 48% of 122 million would be around 58.5 million. So we got 32 we would aspire to get 58. And as the program matures, uh, we can do a few things about that. So uh, first of all, another contextual uh, piece of information that's incredibly important, you've heard about it before, is that the Senate Bill 535 is a way of trying to uh, localize those dollars in disadvantaged uh, communities. And as SCAG, has two-thirds of the disadvantaged communities in the state of California, it follows that there should be additional investment within the SCAG region. And so there are things that we can do to improve the guidelines to, in turn, improve the performance of, of SCAG in the future. There are things such as uh, jurisdictional caps that were kept at $15 million per per municipality that frankly disadvantaged uh, the city of Los Angeles. And yet, we can point the finger, but they say, you know, you're pointing the finger at someone, there's like four pointing back at you. And so, to quote Shakespeare, you know, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. So what can we do? What do we have control over within the SCAG region to do a better job? And at the end of this program, this section, you will be hearing from developers, you'll be hearing from municipalities that participated in this past program, and uh, you'll also get a context on where the program is going generally, so that we'll have a better understanding on how we can perform better in the future. We're going to improve our batting average next time with the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program, not just because we're able to read the pitches better, uh, we're going to improve our batting average because we're going to actually uh, get better at hitting the ball. So with that, let me introduce our panel. Uh, first up is Mike Walsh. Uh, Mike has worked for the Coachella Valley Housing Coalition for more than eight years. And Mr. Walsh facilitates the development of affordable housing uh, from inception to lease up. And Mr. Walsh has secured more than $80 million in financing from federal, state, and local and private institutions for the development of affordable housing uh, throughout Southern California. Mr. Walsh received his master's degree 
uh, from Northwestern University and bachelor's degree from Stonehill College. We have just been joined by Steve Lefevre. And Steve is uh, joining us from the city of Southgate, where he's been since 1992, and he currently serves as director of community development. He's over 35 years of experience in municipal planning, private consulting, and real estate development. He secured in, he served in both public and private sectors, and includes the uh, Irvine Company, City of Manhattan Beach, and others. And he's a California native and graduate of Cal Poly Pomona. Bill Paveo is a board member of the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing, otherwise known as SCAMF, and recently retired from his role as executive director of the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee. And in this position as executive director, he was involved in awarding $800 million in ARA dollars uh, and for affordable housing. And Mr. Paveo has both a bachelor's and a master's degree from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Ryan Wiggins is our cleanup hitter. I'm going to keep doing the baseball metaphor, by the way. So. Uh, Ryan is the state cap and trade cap. Well, that's kind of a baseball thing. Cap and trade. Oh, trade too. That's also baseball. Campaign manager at Transform, great organization coordinating the statewide movement to ensure that revenues from AB 32 are reinvested in world-class transit systems and livable communities. Uh, Ryan is a veteran of the U.S. Navy, and he holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from Davis and his master's in the same from American University. So uh, leading us off is Mike Walsh. So Mike, you're up. Uh, good afternoon. I'll wait a moment, my, uh, but introduce myself. My name is Mike Walsh, and I work for the Coachella Valley Housing Coalition, and I will say that I'm very grateful to be in Los Angeles today, where it is about 30 degrees cooler than the 115 we are in. So if you want to have more meetings you want me to come up to in August, I'm more than welcome to come whenever and willing. Uh, but I'm here because we were successful in this last round of affordable housing and sustainable communities for our March Veterans Village project. And before I get into that uh, program, just give you an overview for people who aren't familiar with uh, the Coachella Valley Housing Coalition. We were originally uh, established in 1982 in the city of Coachella with a $10,000 grant from the Aetna Foundation. And since that time, we've expanded to develop more than 4,300 homes throughout Riverside, Imperial, and San Bernardino counties, doing both single-family and multifamily. Originally, we saw ourselves as mostly a rural organization, farm worker housing, but we've expanded into doing multiple types of housing for people with HIV and AIDS, special needs populations. And this project, uh, which is for, for veterans, um, it's, and it's located on the former March Air Force Base to give people some context off the 215 freeway. Uh, the base was decommissioned in the mid-90s, and the March Joint Powers Authority which is made up of the cities of uh, Paris, uh, Moreno Valley, Riverside, and the, and the county all sit, sit on it, they were tasked with redeveloping the excess, excess land. And roughly 10 years ago, a group called the United States Veterans Initiative started working with uh, the March JPA about providing housing for homeless and recently homeless veterans in the Riverside, uh, er, Riverside County area. And they came up with the idea of this master plan to do, uh, do housing for veterans, which is similar to programs that they operate in the cities of Long Beach, Inglewood, and throughout, throughout the country. And about four years ago, they came to us and said, can you help us uh, develop this? And we said, well, maybe. Uh, let's, uh, get, uh, let's see how it, how it works. Uh, and the project that we ultimately settled on was an 138-unit development that sits on roughly 3.4 acres, which has a density of 40 dwelling units the acre. And I highlighted that because for us in Riverside County, in order to qualify for AHSC dollars, you have to have a minimum density of 30 dwelling units per acre. 
for a lot of our communities in Riverside County, that is a challenge. Um, and it's, I, I, I see Councilman Harnick from the City of Palm Desert smiling because that can be very challenging to get through. And so this was a unique thing for us. This is the first project that we've ever developed at this level of density. Uh, it has 116 efficiency units, six one-bedrooms, 16 two-bedrooms uh, units. And part of the way we were able to get to that density is because we have so many efficiency units in ones and two bedrooms. Uh, this is a comment we've made to AHSC. Uh, for family housing, it's harder to get to that higher density. So doing three, three and four bedrooms, it's more challenging. Uh, but this project also features 13,000 square feet of community and supportive, supportive services uh, space. As this is 100% for veterans, specifically for homeless veterans, they need additional services. So we have case managers on site. We have exercise space, computer learning programs, and other resources to get veterans back on their feet and get back, uh, back into society. And circling back to an earlier question, it's like why is CVHC involved in a veteran project when we've never done a veteran project before? And it starts, when these deals come about, there needs to be a certain level of soul searching within your organization, because whether it fits. And we came to the conclusion that it's consistent with our mission to provide safe, decent, and affordable housing for people of Riverside County and the Inland Empire as a whole. Uh, it's a population that is, that is getting a lot of attention now, but it's getting a lot of attention because we haven't done enough for this population for a number, number of years. And with the number of veterans that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, we need, uh, CVHC saw the need to assist our uh, fellow organization, United States Veterans Initiative, in helping this deserving population. And the other thing is, this was going to be our first joint venture. And the only reason why we did a joint venture is because we're dealing with a truly excellent partner. United States Veterans Initiative is, is the largest veterans organization uh, providing transitional and supportive housing services in the country. And they've been invested in that community in the Riverside area for a number of years. And what I've come to realize, and we talk in acronyms in the affordable housing community and probably every industry, but the VA has a whole other set of acronyms that we needed a translator, a new lexicon, and United States Veterans Initiative helped us with that. They are going to be providing the long-term support services for this development, but they're also our partner going forward with the construction of the project. Uh, the question, like for those in the room that would want to get involved and do something like this, how is where does the money come from? And so these are all of our sources: four uh, percent tax credits, ta tax-exempt bonds. HCD's multifamily housing program, the a affordable housing program, the JPA committed the ground as well as dollars to the project. Thanks to the County of Riverside, we were able to work with HUD to secure 75 project-based VASH vouchers, basically the v uh, Veterans Affairs and Supportive Housing Program, uh, as well as we were able to get the new Veterans Housing and Homeless Prevention Program, and we were lucky enough to get the AHSC Fund funding, and I say committed after all these because after working with all these various different funding sources, I feel the need to be committed myself because it's quite challenging. So I, I, mean, uh, I tried to keep this relatively brief uh, because some of the lessons learned for this project, both on the AHSC side, like first of all, it's like work with excellent people uh, for those cities in the Inland Empire that work, want to work with an excellent people. CVHC is pretty excellent, but in general, when you're looking at partnering with people, ensure that you're working with excellent people. The second is like talk to people who have done these types of deals before. Specifically, the cap and trade, it was a new program, but the software Cali Mod has been used by other jurisdictions before, so we sought out a consultant to do the Cali Mod calculation for us, and that. Like they, I, we have some people that are more familiar with this, but they start talking, it just goes right over my head, and I, I really needed their level of success, uh, uh, expertise in ensuring our success. Uh, the third is 90% of success is showing up. We weren't sure we were going to be funded, but we saw the guidelines and we put in an app application. And uh, we talked before, the guidelines in this first round, we were involved early on with some recommendations. and. This was our only project in our pipeline that would qualify due to the density. And specifically for a lot of our rural programs, uh, we were talking with other people around the state, well, we should just put the applications in 
because you don't know what's going to happen, but this could also help form guidance for the Strategic Growth Council in the future. Like, this is what uh, works and this is what didn't work in this last round. And like, look at this great project that uh, could work. And we were fortunate in that we put together the application and it, and it worked. Uh, the fourth is stay consistent with with your uh, with your mission, and for there's a lot of government organizations in in the room, and for that it could also mean stay consistent with what your your city's goals and values or what the community planning that it's been doing there for nonprofits. It's staying consistent with what you do well, and I when I think of, I think about this like the, the telling our stories to the Strategic Growth Council, I think of. The former host of Meet the Press, Tim Russert, good, good Irish Catholic that I always res, uh, respect. But he uh, he w used to work for Senator Tim Moynihan, and he was really nervous that he was working there because he was just went to a small liberal arts college, and all everyone else that worked there went to Harvard, and he's he was going to go and quit. And Tim uh, Senator Moynihan told him, "He's like, it's like Tim, I can never tell uh, teach these guys what it's like to work uh, on the back of a garbage truck working your summer jobs. Like, but I can teach you what what they know. And for us, if you have a difficult project to, to, or in a unique situation, get in front of SDC and um, and explain that story. Like, why why you're doing what you why is your deal deal important? And the lastly, it's maybe a little basic. Is like. But read the guidelines, not just when they're developed, but early on in the process. Comment regularly, but be open because this program is going to push you. Like I told Bill, like that this application was nine times harder than any tax credit application I ever did, and it, it was it was very challenging because it pushed us, and they were asking so many different things. And uh, I was uh, just been telling everyone that the Strategic Growth Council as a body. I go into the meeting and seeing all the multiple dis different disciplines. Like, it's like, oh, I can see now why they're asking that question because you have someone from the ag, ag group here. Oh, transportation's here, and it's different for us people that do affordable housing. You're not just dealing with HCD; you're de dealing with everybody, <laughs> which is a challenge. But read and reread the regulations. One thing we we saw for our partners is they may not they misunderstood or didn't ask the questions needed early on. And sometimes we may self-disqualify ourselves, but we may, may not think we qualify. Uh, but that's that's uh, my last point. If people want to get in touch with me and have any follow-up questions, there's uh, my contact information. But thank you so much for this opportunity and getting me out of the heat. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I'm late. I'm fitting 12 pounds in a 10-pound day, so I, I apologize for that. Um, my name's Steve Lefevre. I'm the Director of Community Development for the City of Southgate. Uh, Mike's here because he got funded. I'm here because we didn't. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me first tell you that the whole point of this exercise is we didn't, we didn't have a project ready. But we decided to move forward anyway. And so you, the whole point here is to be creative, to react, and to move. Uh, what do they say? Just keep your legs moving? We took four projects, and we merged them into a single project and rewrote the project description to submit for the grant. We have a new college campus coming. It's about 9,000 to 10,000 students. They have an EIR already approved. We had an affordable housing project already approved, 216 units. We had a complete streets project already underway, and uh, we, we were lacking some funds. And we had a bicycle master plan implementation program already in the planning stages. We combined all four projects, rewrote the job, uh, the project description, and moved forward. Unfortunately, based on uh, uh, interviews afterwards, we didn't leverage the project to meet the needs of the um, Strategic Growth Council. The projects were very heavily leveraged, but because of the boundary restrictions, we, it didn't work, it didn't translate well. So we learned a lesson. Um, so I just want to let you understand, the city of Southgate saw this coming. I don't know how, but we did. In 2005, we began an effort to change our general plan. We it was a major metamorphosis. The, the new general plan of the city is totally unlike anything that has 
occurred before it. We're built out. We changed everything. We took all the densities out of our, our single family residential neighborhoods that are traditionally, that are zoned R2 and R3. We moved them all along the corridors and adjacent to all of our major intersections and transit stations. We adopted a healthy community element, probably if not the first, one of the first elements in the city to do, uh, in the state of California. What we did is we went from densities of 16 units to the acre to 40 units to the acre to 21 to 40, 40 to 75, and 75 to over 100 units to the acre. We jumped, we ran as fast as we could, and we created a, a new template. The general plan was overwhelmingly approved by the public, overwhelmingly approved by the council. We then adopted a zoning, uh, an interim zoning code, and unfortunately, we also expanded our redevelopment agency at the time to help accommodate that. Oh well, can't move them all. Uh, and, uh, and then we initiated uh, a comprehensive zone update for the rest of the city. That was adopted in uh, April of, of this year. Just to give you a sense, since April, I have 15 proposals for housing development in the city, most in areas where housing was never allowed before. That's 1,360 units in total. They range from apartments to condos to townhouses to senior housing to student housing to workforce housing. And I just met today with a developer for affordable housing. So there is, we have set the template. We're working as hard as we can to move the projects forward. We've got over 600,000 square feet of retail in process under construction. We've got, we just retented it over a million and a half square feet of industrial that is bringing new jobs to the community. We just, we're, we're working on two open space uh, repairing and habitat projects along the freeway and the river. We've got, we've got new parks. We've got uh, the public works department is aggressively widening road, building bridges. We've got three transit stations in the process of entitlements. Uh, that are they're a few years away, but we're working on all of these things. What we did is we decided to look at the future and jump. And just because we didn't get this grant, because we, we misinterpreted some of the rules, we didn't know them as well, we had a great conversation with the SGC, Alice and Joe, a few weeks ago to kind of debrief on why, what went wrong, and we won't miss the next time. We are a disadvantaged city. The entire city of Southgate is disadvantaged. We're 13,000 people per square mile. We're seven and a half square miles in size. I have 32 school campuses, 33, the 33rd coming. I have 28,000 students and soon to have probably 35,000 students in the city. We're very young. We've got lots of kids coming to 30. You can't move in the city because of the kids. So we have a huge future ahead of us. But my, 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 my charge here today is we failed the first time around. We won't fail the second time around. We're putting the template together as fast as we can to set, to set the tone, to set the projects in place that we can move forward. Um, and you need to be creative. You need to think outside the box. If you don't have a project, pick one, pick several projects and work around it. Try to work it together. Be creative as, as you can. Uh, that's, I have two SGC, uh, actually two specific plans and a zoning code that were funded by the SGC. SCAG, thank you very much, has just funded another specific plan for a, strand, for a transit station in TOD. Uh, so we go after everything. We don't shy away. We do some in-house. We hire some consultants. Uh, we do as much as we can uh, to, to move forward. And yes, redevelopment is gone. Our, our mantra is get over it. Let's move on. We've, there, are other, there are other fish to fry. We just put together a deal for a 375,000 square foot shopping center. The city stepped into the plate with, of what the redevelopment agency would, and we did the best we could and set the template and, a, and design guidelines and a funding program that a redevelopment agency would be proud of doing. 
but we did it through the city and we moved the project forward. Now it's being shopped throughout the state as one of the new templates to use for development. Uh, mixed use, I have four mixed use projects uh, uh, in, in the works. So we, uh, without going too much further, I just want to say, if we can do it, you can do it. Uh, we're a disadvantaged community. We don't have any money. I have two planners on staff. But we just keep moving. Everybody in my department is ambidextrous. There are, there's no job description in any, of my, in any of my staff that I can't have them do housing, I can't have them do planning, I can't have them do inspections. We change job, in, uh, job descriptions so everybody can do everything because that's what we need. We just need to react and we need to run. And so uh, I will end it there. Good afternoon. I'm Bill Paveo, and I'm here representing SCAMP. And um, I'm going to tag on to a few things you heard earlier in the afternoon. Um, SCAMP, um, first and foremost, wants to um, uh, commend the Strategic Growth Council for rolling out that first round of funding and, and successfully committing to, to good projects throughout the state. Uh, but SCAMP does have some specific recommendations for uh, consideration for improvements going forward. Uh, so I wanted to share those just briefly with you. Uh, we've touched on a few already this afternoon. Uh, and they kind of come in four big categories. The, the first category um, is sort of a, a, an issue unto itself, which is uh, when a statewide organization tries to get resources out statewide, uh, how do you make sure you're doing that in an equitable way? And there's been issues raised already this afternoon around, hey, did Southern California get an equitable share of these resources in this first round? So SCAMP would urge uh, the Strategic Growth Council to consider a system um, of, for lack of a better term, a system of, a system of apportionments, that perhaps there ought to be regional buckets, if you will. And, and the, the letter that memorializes these remarks um, to the council uh, harkens to the Tax Credit Allocation Committee's system uh, up in Sacramento, where they've identified regions and, and basically established buckets of resources for each region. Uh, so, for example, the city of Los Angeles is a region unto itself in that, in that system. And the balance of the county, the balance of LA County is a region. Orange County is a region. The Inland Empire is a region. San Diego County is a region. Um, so that particular system over at the Tax Credit Allocation Committee uh, really was established looking at certain distress indicators that were appropriate for that funding source. Probably other distress indicators uh, might be equally or more appropriate for this funding source, and you've already heard about um, sort of environmentally distressed communities and other metrics that they could look to to try to establish what would be a fair apportionment of resources across regions. That might result in Southern California getting a larger chunk of these resources uh, going forward. Uh, the second large category is really just um, incentivizing and rewarding um, ambitious projects that, that the first time around there were a few features that might have um, kind of whacked those projects out of the system and they might have really resulted in very good public policy outcomes. And so a few changes going forward that might be considered, including things like the system currently re rewards projects for requesting as few resources as possible from the funding source relative to the, um, um, to the greenhouse gas reduction anticipated from the project, which is understandable. They, they want to spread these resources around. And so if they can sprinkle the dollars uh, into a large number of projects, great public policy outcome. But one result is, in part, if you're only going to put a little subsidy into the project, then those projects have to go find other resources, which frequently will push them into the tax credit system's 9% competition. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that system, there are really kind of two big buckets of tax credits at the state level. One is a 9% credit, and it provides a more generous subsidy to each project. But those credits are limited, and you have to go in and compete for them. There's another bucket of federal credits that's unlimited for practical purposes, and that's the 4% credit. And so SCAMP's thinking on this is if the award amounts were somewhat larger, 
more projects could probably go through that non-competitive tax credit system. So you wouldn't have circumstances where perhaps they won uh, in this particular competition, but then they go lose in the 9% competition. Rather, let's have them win in this competition and then just go right to that non-competitive 4% system. Um, just a couple of other ideas. Um, there are a few features that, that are worrisome to developers of affordable housing, especially nonprofit developers of affordable housing, uh, and that has to do with, with um, descriptions of potential liability for these projects. And one thought is rather than um, uh, these, these forms of, of uh, joint and severable liability uh, for the performance of these projects, perhaps adopt what other agencies do at the state level, which is a, a series of um, negative point systems. So if you don't perform, then the next time through, you're going to get negative points in the competition and are unlikely to be successful again for a while. Um, that would probably be, in one sense, equally punitive and yet not you know, potentially financially devastating to a nonprofit affordable housing developer. Um, things like, uh, at the moment, CEQA clearance, um, uh, is a threshold matter, perhaps that ought to be a scoring matter, as in it may be you have not quite completed the CEQA process and yet you're close, you've got a good meritorious project, perhaps all things being considered, that ought not to eliminate you from the competition. The third big category um, is to reward projects that, that achieve that greenhouse gas reduction um, perhaps more effectively. Uh, one recommendation from SCAMP is that there's another um, statewide organization, the California Housing Partnership Corporation. Uh, they developed a report entitled, Why Creating and Preserving Affordable Homes Near Transit is a Highly Effective uh, Climate Protection Strategy. Kind of a lengthy title, but right on point, uh, apropos this discussion this afternoon. They have great data in that report that we think could be useful to the administration of this program uh, up in Sacramento. Uh, we think that data would help refine um, the connection and, and perhaps can play into the scoring of the linkages between um, deeper affordability and greenhouse gas reductions, uh, greater density, uh, reduced parking uh, on site and, and reduced parking requirements for the specific project. This report we think can be very useful in quantifying that and weaving it into the scoring system. Uh, a couple of other ideas include um, uh, emphasizing deeper income targeting, since that really constitutes the core ridership in a lot of these transit systems uh, throughout California. And so it seems that projects that have deeper targeting to extremely low income households in particular probably ought to be rewarded competitively because those are the more likely uh, riders of the local transit system. Um, let's see, one, one more note in this category. Um, that the system ought to um, incentivize um, looking at both the project's energy efficiency, and for example, a lot of tax credit projects now are very energy efficient, and that also ought to be considered in this program and rewarded competitively, as well as even the use of the commercial space. So if it's a residential development and perhaps ground floor has some commercial space, what is going to be the commu uh, commercial use of that space and there are um, higher and lesser intensity um, greenhouse gas emission uses for the commercial space, and perhaps that ought to be scored. The fourth and final category, it's just one point, which is um, we commend the council for their transparency and involving folks in, in uh, providing comments and feedback. We urge you to keep doing that, and the more transparent, the better. Uh, we think that results in great public policy. Final note. Some of you represent rural communities, and just talking with Mike uh, before the session, um, rural communities, there are other state affordable housing systems that have really kind of peeled off rural communities and treated them almost as a separate category of competitors. And that might be worth considering in this program as well. They are just a different, a different thing. And perhaps they ought to be scored against one another in a rural competition. And that's it. Thanks. So this is Ryan Wiggins. Um, my presentation's up. That was quick. Uh, I, I work with Transform. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we are a statewide organization. However, I, I work down here locally. 
Um, Transform also collaborated on that CHPC report, why affordable housing is a good climate protection strategy. Um, and, and we also work with a, a large number of housing groups that are statewide as well as conservation and active transportation and equity groups. And um, we've been really been involved in the AHSC in two ways. One is which we've been involved in the crafting of the guidelines or providing input since the very beginning, since the, the program was established. And the other part is we actually have act, acted as consultants to some of the applicants in, these, in this particular program. Um, we acted as consultants to 19 of them and we actually 13 of them were actually selected for awards at the end of it. So we learned a lot of lessons um, that I think I've heard echoed in some fashion or another by the first panel and this and even some of the, the questions and comments from the, from the audience is that really this is, in, if we're go looking into the future as Hassan says, it's really about partnerships. Um, and, and developing those good partnerships between the, the nonprofit sector and the public sector and, and other individuals and groups really early on. Um, this is not just important for actually, actually creating the relationships, but it's also important for building the technical capacity because this is a very steep technical learning curve. Um, the Cal EMOD, which was mentioned as really the primary model for which, which GHGs are, are quantified is, is fairly opaque for a lot of folks who haven't been involved in this field before. And, and its real focus is VMT. So um, applicants have, are somewhat overwhelmed by this oftentimes, not having dealt with these types of issues before. And then one of the things that Allison had mentioned was there really was a, a strict timeline for, for applications the first time around. So this required you to either have a project that was near that, was very far along in the conceptual stage, um, oftentimes, some of these projects were actually legacy projects from redevelopment that went ahead and moved forward. And so going forward, the real key is, you know, how many of those legacy projects do we have left and how many of really innovative transformational projects are going to come forward um, from these new partnerships or even existing partnerships? Uh, I, I anticipate this second time around with the, guide, with the revision of the guidelines, which is currently happening, that as Steve mentioned, there will be a lot more experience gained from the first time, so they'll be able to put, learn from those. Um, ideally, the, the, the new guidelines will go ahead and make some of these needed revisions that have been asked for, and there will be a lot more projects being awarded in places that are relatively new to this type of process. Um, uh, what other types of roles can the public sector play? Um, you know, there's the SCAG region has a lot of disadvantaged communities. Um, so whether you're in the in the government side or you're in the community side, there's certainly an issue of capacity in terms of staffing, uh, fiscal fiscal capacity as well to to bring these projects forward. In terms of partnerships, there's there's issues on the community side of whether or not some of these organizations have both the funding and the staff capacity and the the technical and policy knowledge to actually bring forth and create these partnerships. Um, it's, it's really encouraging to, to see things like uh, Cynthia's discussion earlier of, of the, the technical funds that are out there and what they're looking forward to. Um, the $8 million that was mentioned earlier as far as the, the potential in the budget for technical capacity is another thing that can move forward. Um, but there also is obviously a role SCAG can play, as Hassan, as, as Hassan mentioned, and moving forward to help applicants actually run through the modeling scenarios and, and decipher the guidelines somewhat. You know, these, these are, this is a very complex integrated program. Um, the guidelines are not easy if you have not looked at them before, but it's, there's only so much you can simplify them considering that this is a program that will integrate housing, transportation, and possibly several other things. Um, you can't simplify it completely all the way. So we're going to, there's a learning curve for sure. So I can say that, you know, because our organization and our coalition, the Sustainable Communities for All Coalition, have worked on this from the very beginning, you know, we actually, some of this will be, will be echoing um, Bill's comments, but uh, we, we see some definite technical fixes to this, which SGC is aware of and has actually even discussed these to one length or another in their listening sessions, which just completed. But, uh, you know, there is this question of integration going forward. And, you know, we, in the current modeling, there are certain things which are either undercounted or aren't counted at all, which could potentially um, really lead to more transformational projects and also lead to projects in places that aren't your typical high-density, transit-rich neighborhoods. Uh, one of those is active transportation. You know, the modeling currently now kind of somewhat undercounts active transportation. And so that, that's a key thing, connection to transit, connections to key destinations is really going to help us spur mode shift, 
um, create greater greenhouse gas reductions. Other things such as potentially counting energy efficiency in projects would actually lead to greater GHG reductions, as well as potentially natural resources, things like urban forestry, which leads to a variety of benefits. Um, it reduces energy, energy costs in buildings, reduces urban heat island effects, air quality, a variety of things which can actually increase greenhouse gas reductions, but also significant co-benefits to communities as well. Um, so we can see those opportunities. There's uh, adjustments to the affordability, which is already mentioned, and the report that we collaborated on with CHPC. Um, density, uh, there not only is there a, a density floor, but there's a density ceiling in this. So there has been interest in some of the applicants to actually having higher densities in really metro areas um, where, where their, their city allows for it. But once you hit that ceiling, you're actually your greenhouse gas reductions cap out. So there, there's there's a variety of things. There's it's there's a long list of potential of potential modifications which could be done. Um, I would also just reiterate commending SGC for the job they have done, despite the limitations of the guidelines. You know they put together a really complex program in a short amount of time. So you know there's a lot to learn from that as well. Excuse me, this is the uh, South Bay, and we're having a real difficult time hearing you. You're breaking up dramatically on our transmission. Okay, I'll try to hold it closer. I'm not sure if it's my voice. Okay, I'll try yelling. Um, that's a lot better. Issues, thanks. Thank you. One of the other issues that's been brought up is geographic distribution. Um, you know, our coalition has certainly looked at a variety of models, including the TCAC, um, the Active Transportation Program, the Multi Housing Family Pro Program, and others, at which we could actually maintain the competitive balance of this program, but also have a, a, an assurance that a certain amount of funding would go back to regions. I think that stems from the, from the realization, as was mentioned earlier, that you know, whether you're in urban areas, suburban areas, or rural areas, that there's huge differences between those different categories, and there's huge difference inside of them as well. As an example, the Bay Area, highly urban, Los Angeles, core, highly urban, but very different maturation as far as transit systems, tra housing, all of this. So having a competitive pot, and what we've kind of looked at is having some competitiveness at the state level, but then regional competitiveness as well as a rural competitive program would allow some of that distribution going forward. Um, and then I'll just say, go to the next slide, and just say one of the things, there's a lot of discussion why the Bay Area did, Bay Area did well. My organization is actually from the Bay Area. It's been there for a long time. What we, what, what we can say is that there's been a long-term partnership between the public, the private, and the nonprofit sector to actually adopt plans, to develop capacity, to really work together. There's a very much one-to-one, -one first name basis among these organizations. So I would say, what can SCAG really do going forward, as far as a region, and potentially SCAG as an MPO, is to help create this capacity. And one of the the really keys to this program is integration of housing and transportation. And so the housing folks are sometimes not really up to speed on what the transportation folks do and vice versa. So if we actually really want to integrate these things, it would be great to actually sponsor, to create that knowledge amongst each other. And then, of course, the last thing has come up again and again, which is technical assistance. Um, you know, obviously the state has a role to play here, but I think, you know, there's a lot of capable nonprofit organizations in the region, SCAMP in this region, the Coachella Valley Group, um, around there's, there's organizations like ours which have worked on its technical capacity, but, you know, there's a way in which, and I'm not proposing any way in particular, we can actually work together to really get out, especially into disadvantaged communities to push this forward. Last thing I will say is that, um, is that I should have put this on here, but we have a, a, a site we just launched called climatebenefitscalifornia.org where if you're interested, we've actually begun mapping all of the greenhouse gas reduction fund programs. And so you can go there and you can see in your particular legislative district, your county or region, where the, all these different programs are being awarded to. There's a lot left that haven't been mapped, but you can see what the success stories are in your region. You can contact them. We can talk about how to actually integrate better projects together. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. So segueing into uh, Q&A, um, I noticed during the last session there were a lot of questions uh, related to the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities program. And so I'm, I'm hoping that our panelists from the, the first session would also uh, field questions as well. And we have Alice and Joe from the Strategic Growth Council who could uh, conceivably uh, answer very specific questions. So. 
Uh, I really want to commend, you know, Mike and Steve and Bill and Ryan for really great presentations. And, and Steve, I, I just wanted to pull out one salient fact, I think. What, what you were saying is that the, the, uh, this cap-and-trade program has been a stimulus internally to your own city to uh, move on, on policies that would uh, position the city much more favorably to receive these funds. Would that be an accurate statement? Yes. The, we, we survive on grants and outside funding because we don't we, – we were nearly bankrupt at one point in time. <laughs> Uh, and so we just decided we had to get aggressive, and we, we, as as you indicated, we thought that this was an inevitable, an inevitability when the state and the federal government moved in this direction. So we decided to position ourselves in order to make that happen. It's a really important takeaway. Another thing I also wanted to emphasize that was just brushed on very lightly is that the Strategic Growth Council will be. Uh, coming out with new guidelines, and I think we have a hint that there may even be some substantial revisions to those guidelines. They've just uh, done a statewide uh, uh, evaluation of the program. They had listening sessions in Sacramento and Los Angeles, and they will be releasing their new draft guidelines for this program sometime in the next six weeks mid to late September, so eight weeks. Yes, I know. When you put it in weeks, it sounds almost like tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> so at this point, uh, we'd like to uh, solicit questions from the audience. Um, are there any folks uh, here? Um, yes. Yes. Oh, first, uh, Council Member Solly Wells. Uh, well, well, thank you. It was very valuable from a city perspective to, to get the kind of lessons learned. And I, I just wanted to back up to my earlier question where I kind of felt bitter about uh, Southern California. Um, I wanted to take a step back and uh, say how outstanding this program is uh, in its conception, in its goals. Um, and And I guess the bitterness came from knowing that these, the things that it addresses are chronically underfunded, undervalued, and yet they're probably the most important things in order to sustain our communities um, today and going in the future. So I didn't want to m miss the opportunity to say, uh, you know, when, when I go to regional conferences and I talk about, you know, environmental justice as being a department in California, uh, or talk about the cap and trade uh, program and what we're trying to do. Um, we really are, you know, the envy of of uh, the country, and hopefully we'll be able to leave this as a model for others. So I didn't want to leave by, you know, on, on a bad note. And and also I would be remiss if I didn't invite all of you to Culver City and Venice on Sunday because we have Seek La Via. Uh, from 9 to 4. I know Jonathan <laughs> intimately involved with that organization. Um, so, so if you're still in town, come see uh, some of these uh, in action. Um, Dr. Pastor. So I wanted to uh, say a couple of things about uh, moving forward, actually. Uh, one is, uh, just from some of the discussion, that it's very important when you think about the definition of disadvantaged community, that it's not just socioeconomic disadvantage, it also has to do with environmental overexposure. And that's one of the reasons why so many of the tracks in Southern California would be eligible, because the environmental justice problems are extraordinarily severe in this part of the state. Um, but, I, but for those of you who are kind of used to doing housing stuff just on income, you're also looking at some of these environmental issues. I would say four things for sort of moving forward uh, because, you know, I'm a SoCal person. I want to make sure a lot of resources come this direction uh, and uh, certainly was uh, interested in the uh, 
conception behind the Strategic Growth Initiative and even 535. First, get feedback. I think it's incredibly important that you sat down with the Strategic Growth Council, figured out where the proposal came up short, are able to move ahead, get feedback, they're open. Second, uh, get prepared. Uh, so get prepared for the next round. Uh, make sure that you do the reading uh, that Ryan was talking about. I think others uh, were talking about as well. Third, get assistance. Um, you know, I think it is the case that the folks in Sacramento, in the Bay Area, and elsewhere demand it and got assistance moving forward. It's a little bit harder to do in SCAG. It's a bigger region. It's one MPO for so many different places. So you can understand that as a sort of structural disadvantage that perhaps wasn't addressed in the program, but get assistance. This session today, extraordinarily welcome. This can't be the last time you get assistance. Make sure that you're working with Transform, with consultants, with SCAG to get the assistance to uh, position your proposals. And then finally, get engaged. Don't just think about your project, think about those policies. One of the things that was a real tremendous disadvantage, the jurisdictional caps. Um, you know, I'm totally opposed to the jurisdictional caps. I came on after that was sort of more or less decided. I think we'll be sort of rethinking that as we move forward. There's a number of other suggestions that are being made that are about making structural changes in the program uh, that I think many of the commissioners, uh, members of the Strategic Growth Council are more than open to. So get engaged in the policy-making process. I'm confident that next uh, round, and I think it's important to realize the vast majority of the SCAG area projects that made it through the first hurdle got funded. And that given the fact that we made at least a tentative move in the direction of trying in the absence, trying to see whether or not we could uh, take the ones that didn't make it because of jurisdictional caps and make sure that those get some funding in this next year because we're expecting more money, um, that virtually everything that made it over the top is going to get funded. That tells you something. People are open to Southern California moving ahead. Southern California definitely is the locus for this kind of uh, the nexus between uh, the need to address climate, uh, disadvantaged communities, and the tremendous willingness that's here in a place like Southgate to commit itself to density in a place like Southern California to commit itself to transit. We can do much better the next time. Thank you very much. Yes, we have a question in the audience here. Yes, a lot of the projects that I looked at for Los Angeles have been in the works for quite a while. But the future down here is in tourism and the development of that. And unfortunately, it's through housing and Airbnb and other websites that are literally going to rent their, their places out. At, at this point in time, we have people that actually look for affordable housing, and they can't get answers when they go to these complexes. So what kind of covenants or governance or whatever word I'm looking for is going to not stop this as a run on a investment to just have a hotel business that isn't paying TOT tax or isn't recognized? Thank you very much. So. Um, Allison, has there been any discussion at the state level uh, currently? Come, I'll hand this to you. Has there been any discussion at the state level about the this new economy and Airbnb? Um, so this program is not intended to fund those types of, um, of units. The requirement for affordable housing puts very strict covenants and requirements on the long-term nature of that affordability. Um, and, and so there's, um, this is uh, in part why the Department of Housing and Community Development is so actively engaged. They monitor that, uh, that those, those units are are essentially prohibited from turning into those kinds of, 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 of short-term rentals. Um, and so that, this is not that kind of program. Um, and I think a lot of those conversations are happening at the local level and certainly a concern. Thank you. What we'd like to do now is to go to the regional video conference uh, sites. And so Coachella Valley, are, are you guys there? Do you have any questions? We're here, no questions. Thank you. Imperial County? No questions, sir. No questions. Orange County? Okay, moving on. Uh, San Bernardino?
I'm interpreting your silence to mean no question. Okay. Uh, South Bay. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Uh, Ventura. No questions. Thank you. Uh, Western Riverside County. No questions. All right. Thank you very much. Now, uh, to wrap this up, we have, oh, please, Allah. Can you turn on your mic and move to you? Yes. Maybe a month ago, there was um, a meeting about the affordable housing results at the California Community Foundation. What are the non Would you what absolutely fight for, and maybe what you feel a little bit more. Do you feel like you've gotten your answer, or what can we do to give you a more precise answer? Yeah. Oh. Thanks very much. Yes, uh, I and Manuel also attended many of the coalition meetings so that we could hear clearly what the issues were in Southern California. I, I think Manuel clearly stated of us are very interested in making sure that we are well represented as the funds are given out. I mean, I think we clearly know that uh, the jurisdictional cap has to go. Um, I'm not sure we know exactly what the replacement might be that will allocate the funds fairly, and I think we're very interested in some of the suggestions that we have heard today. I think we clearly heard about the issue of liability and how, you know, ways that that might be changed. Um, my own sense from being on the council since last October and working closely with all of you is that um, there is a difference between North and South in terms of just the technical expertise. They have a longer history of successfully working together to get statewide money, and I think we have a little ways to go. And so the technical assistance and finding structural ways to bring all of the transportation and the housing people together is going to be a big issue, and I think that's really important. Um, I will point out that when we gave out the allocations for the first round, um, uh, Manuel was not yet on the council, but I did ask the council at that meeting to make a commitment to uh, get rid of the cap and to fund the four projects that were left out simply because of the cap. There were four projects in our area and one in San Francisco. And uh, I wanted them to make a commitment that that $25 million for those four projects uh, would come immediately out of the second allocation. And without being able to make a commitment about a future vote, several of the council members did agree that that would be an important consideration as soon as we got the allocation for the second round. So, I think there is a commitment from the SGC. I think we want it to be fair, and we want everybody to feel like they have a fair shot at the money. So I do think that we've learned a lot, and I, I think we are prepared to go back and fight for the things that are critical for Southern Cal. Thank you. Thank you. And, and with that, I would like to invite Washa uh, Lynn from uh, SCAG to come up with uh, some summary comments. Thank you, Jonathan. I am not Hassan Krada, nor Michelle Martinez. I am Hua Sha Liu. I'm the Director for Land Use and Environmental Planning here at SCAG. I have two highlights I would really like to make, and I will not take for more than three minutes here. I promise you, so you can get on road and go back and have your happy hour. The, the first the highlight I want to make is that absolutely it is important to see that if it's all possible to have certain areas that the guidelines to be revised. And SCAG and our partners have conveyed your concerns and your requests to SGC multiple times. And one specific example is that 
if we are having an equity, equity-based uh, target, GHG reduction target under SB 375, then we should also have an equity-based funding to support that implementation. Having said that, my first message is really more on the following. As we move forward, as Jonathan said earlier, we must get ready ourselves. And we have a great projects. We just have as good projects in Southern California as in Northern California, if not even better. But it is a challenge for us to look at what we ourselves can do, not just only SGC, we can do to translate those good projects into good applications. And that leads to my second highlight. That means we need to work together as partners. We need to work together with SGC as partners. We need to work together among all of us as partners. And SCAG is here to help all of us to advance and our partners to be here as also help all of us to advance. Although this workshop is being held at a SCAG, but this is really a partnership effort of everyone involved, including all of you who attend this workshop. Quick announcement. We are going to post everything on SCAG's website with all the presentations, so one stop to get all the information for your convenience. Now, I really want to thank you. Yes, that's minimum what we can do. This first workshop is just the beginning. We are going to have two workshops down the road. But just to put this first workshop together, it has really taken lots of staff uh, resource among with our partners. And in addition to thanking our partners, as Hassan said earlier, I do want to call out our core team of uh, AHSE Cap and Trade. Jason Greenspan is the manager. Please stand up. Rick Asher is our program manager, please, well, who is standing already. <laughs> and especially many, many, many thanks to our project manager, Kristen Pauling. Come on. I want you to come up here. Kristen. Kristen, Kristen has been so in instrumental, and I just don't know how to thank her more for all the time and the efforts she has put in. And absolutely, this is so important that we reach out to our partners and everyone. So last but really, really not least, please give another round of applause to all of our panelists and our moderator. <laughs> and and a sin sincere thanks to each and all of you for taking your precious time here and prepare all of these wonderful presentations for information sharing. We look forward to working with all of you and everywhere, uh, everyone who comes to this workshop. So see you sometimes in fall at our second workshop and a third and many after. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>